Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvelous video. This time, exploring the terrifying lore of Jeepers Creepers from the comic books. Jeepers Creepers is a cult classic with the Creeper horribly creeping out audiences all across the world. The mystery around the Creeper has always intrigued moviegoers and horror fans alike, and if you're someone who's interested, we have something incredible in store for you today. After three films, Jeepers Creepers made its comic book debut spanning five creepy and brilliantly illustrated issues. This comic gives series fans a peek at something that many have pondered. Where did the Creeper come from? The comics are relatively uncommon and underrated. However, if you're a Creeper fan, then they are a must read. Buckle up for a spine chilling adventure into the unknown. The real question is, do you want to know? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The detailed comic book narrative explored. The reader is greeted by a scenario showing the creature falling to the ground from the night sky and entering a barn in pursuit of an unidentified object after reading the introduction. Grunts and background noises are the only speech bubbles or conversations present throughout the scenario, which contributes to the atmosphere of mystery surrounding the creature. Although it is evident to the reader that the creature has a purpose in mind, the creature's precise intentions are left unclear. This type of scene, which lacks words, is unusual and particularly helpful in comic books and creates a mystery before diving into the meat of the plot. What we gather is that the Creeper is here and on the hunt. The story then focuses on a young grad student named Devon who sets off to Mexico to do research for his graduation thesis, focusing on the cross-cultural appearances of the dragon in North American mythology from the Aztecs to today. Two key plot lines are highlighted in Jeepers Creepers number one. The Creeper is working on his plan to consume human flesh, while a graduate student named Devon is working on his thesis in Mexico. With the help of Devon's story, the reader gets to know about the hero and learns about his nerdy and awkward personality. The Creeper's tale, on the other hand, is far more engrossing, as one might anticipate given that we watch the monster scavenging for food. We watch as he smiles horrifyingly in anticipation of taking the arm of a person stranded on the side of a road, in true Creeper fashion. The revelation of the Creeper's connections to the Aztecs, however, was the memorable event and the first indication of an origin story. We watch as Devon makes his way to Mexico, finds a cab to drive him to his hotel, and then makes his way to the ancient Aztec city Teotihuacan a breathtaking lost city with fantastic architecture. Although young Devon is interested in something far more sinister that goes beyond the beautiful ancient architecture and carvings, he is interested in the legend of the feathered serpent. Through the beautifully illustrated pages of the comic, we come to learn that Teotihuacan means the birthplace of the gods, and according to Nahua mythology, it was the place where the gods created the universe. It was here that Devon hoped to find the temple of the feathered serpent that would aid in his research of dragon myths. Although, if he knew that he would run into an immortal abomination that surfaced every 23 years, he probably would have changed his mind early on. Devon sneaks away from the guided tour and makes his way to the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. Outside the temple, a sign very clearly says no trespassing, but the young grad student had student loans to pay off, so he walked right in, leaving all inhibition at the door. Little did he know, this decision would lead to horrifying circumstances. Once inside, he explored the temple, taking in the carvings on the wall, depicting the serpent god eating humans. A young native boy interrupts his exploration, and while Devon is scared at first, the boy seems to know all about the legend of the Feathered Serpent, so he listens keenly. The boy tells him that the Feathered Serpent is Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec serpent god. However, this god wasn't like the ones we know and are familiar with. He wasn't benevolent or kind. Instead, he was a hungry being, with the ancient Aztecs having to offer him human sacrifices periodically to keep him satiated and happy so that he wouldn't make them subjects of his wrath and hunger. In fact, according to the boy, the Aztecs apparently kept a whole stable of young men ready for their sacrificial rituals. While some of these men considered it a great honor to be sacrificed to the serpent god, others cowered in fear, not wanting to die. However, once a man was picked, there was no backing out of it. They were not given a choice. It was apparently like a blood lottery. No one knew when their number would be called, an existence where they could be called upon to sacrifice their lives at any moment, and they would have to. 
The person would be brought out in front of the high priest and his acolytes and placed upon a ceremonial rock to begin the summoning of the dragon god. The high priest would plunge a dagger into the man's chest and carve out the still beating heart of the man. The coppery smell of the blood would draw the dragon god to the altar and he would descend from the skies to feast on the heart of the man. Now, this would be a great mythological story, right? It has all the elements, ritual sacrifice, an otherworldly dragon god, and over-enthusiastic priests. But the dragon god turned out to be none other than our dear pal, the Creeper. Hence, this issue cements the idea that the Creeper is actually a dark creature whose existence dates all the way back to the Aztec period, when he was known as the dragon god. Devon's exploration is cut short, however, as he's hauled out of the Temple of the Feathered Serpent by the authorities on account of trespassing. He explains that he's a student and is there for research, and they let him go, but warn him never to come back ever again. Although, right before he leaves, an unknown person comes up to him and hands him a bizarre box, tells him that it holds what Devon seeks, and then disappears without any explanation. Devon opens the box and is shocked to see a lone Aztec dagger within it. As he reaches in to take out the dagger, he mistakenly cuts his finger on the blade, drawing blood, and this action, in some weird way, alerts the Creeper, prompting a telepathic connection between the two. The Creeper's tale is unquestionably the most noteworthy. What distinguishes this comic from others is the flashback of the Creeper's tale and his Aztec roots. This comic is able to stand out among the movies thanks to a brief look into the Creeper's past. Between the varying storylines, the artwork offers a strong and clear voice. The Creeper's story has midnight colors, whereas Devon's is rich with daytime hues. The daytime scene's clear-cut appearance is further enhanced by the coppery tone of the flashback. The characters themselves are given life by Devon's tremulous movements and the Creeper's terrifying growls. All in all, a solid first issue. The story picks up in the second issue as Devon is seen driving quite recklessly to North Carolina in pursuit of the Creeper. He drives all the way to the Cherokee Indian Reservation to look for clues regarding dragon mythology because he believes that the dragon god that he came across in the lost Aztec city was not a one-off example. The dragon imagery of a beast with wings feasting on humans has been around for a long time and in way too many cultures for it to be a coincidence or the result of a hive mind. According to Devon, all his evidence was pointing in the same direction, the direction of a very real entity, the Creeper. He stumbles into a bar and immediately begins asking questions about a creature called the Octana, which makes him immediately unwelcome in the establishment. On his way out, however, he runs into an aged Native American who cautions him that what he's chasing is extremely dangerous. Devon decides to ask the old man some questions, but the man responds to him by saying that he'll answer all his questions the next morning. Seeing no other option, Devon takes the man's word and goes to sleep in his car. The comic panels also shift to show us how the Creeper also goes to sleep in a creepy crypt. The next morning, he's awakened by a cop who questions him, but lets him go when the old man comes looking for him. The man then takes Devon to a secluded cabin in the woods and offers him a drink. He says that the drink is mulberry wine, but Devon gags as the drink goes down his throat, thinking that he was served turpentine. Seconds after ingesting the drink, Devon begins to hallucinate as the man cuts his palm with a dagger. Panels are simply stunning to look at. It's psychedelic, hypnotic, and scary all at once, and the stunning colors perfectly capture the hallucinogenic visions. Through the visions, the old man narrates to Devon the story of the Octana. He says that the Octana has been around ever since man first walked the earth and is the most respected of the dark creatures. He also says that the natives knew to feed the Octana voluntarily to make it happy so that they would not be on the receiving end of wrath. However, feeding the Octana was not a simple task. This was not Santa. They couldn't just leave a glass of milk and some cookies for the creature. What the creature required was human sacrifice, just like the feathered serpent or the dragon god of the Aztecs. The Octana was also none other than the Creeper. The creature craved blood and meat, the flesh of humans. In the hallucination, it also seems like the Creeper was directly talking to Devon, taunting him, asking him to come and see, to come and find him. Devon wakes up from his hallucination and finds himself back in his car, in front of a parking spot. Confused and disoriented, he gets out of the car and wonders what happened to him. Moving on to the third issue in the series, he gets out of bed and takes a long shower, contemplating all the things he's found out during his journey to get to the bottom of the dragon legend. He wonders if his hallucinations are a sign of early-onset schizophrenia. He wonders if his hallucinations are a sign of early-onset schizophrenia. <laughs> and it doesn't take long for the creeper to show up in his bar through mirror. 
His hallucinations continue as he interacts with the Creeper, who surprisingly also seems to be pissed that he's somehow connected to this young, geeky human. Angrily, he smashes a skull against the wall of his crypt and the scene changes to a disturbed Devon, cradling himself in the shower, coming to the realization that he has a telepathic connection to an ancient, immortal cannibal demon. He then makes his way to Roanoke to continue his research because he believes that unpaid student loans are far scarier than ancient, flesh-eating demons. Hmm. However, on his way there, he almost crashes into a truck, one that looks eerily like the one the Creeper drives in the movies. His car spirals out of control, and as he steps out of the vehicle with minor cuts and scratches, we see that the Creeper is also hurt because of the connection they share. This leads to the Creeper vowing that he will not sleep until he finds Devon, kills him, severs the connection, and satiates his need for blood. The chase has officially begun. He checks into a bed and breakfast in Roanoke and makes his way to the Historical Society, a place where people like to cosplay as if they're living in a little house on the prairie. He stumbles into a few of the cosplayers before finding a closed room, and using the mysterious dagger that was given to him, he cuts his palm to try and test his healing power. But that turns out to be a terrible decision. As he slits his hand and leaves the room, he realizes that people are no longer cosplaying. It seems like, somehow, he stepped back in time. However, he snaps out of his daze when he hears a man wailing, and as he goes over to check it out, he realizes that the wailing man is someone whose eyes have been gouged out by none other than the Creeper. The man cautions all the other villagers that he is coming, the Devil himself. Hence, in this time period, the Creeper is seen to be an incarnation of the Devil, and not a dark creature or godlike in earlier civilizations. As the scene unfolds in front of him, the Creeper descends upon the villagers, killing and maiming them without a care in the world. He rips people apart like they were made of paper and beheads people left and right. As people run for their lives, the Creeper spots Devon and makes his way over to him. He comes right up to Devon, takes the dagger from his hands, and carves something into his skin. Devon passes out promptly and wakes up in the middle of the field, on the prairie with a bunch of people surrounding him, trying to make sure that he was all right. What he notices immediately is the word Centralia, carved on his arm in capital letters, and the issue ends there. The first image in the fourth issue shows a ten-year-old Devon playing with little plastic soldiers that are all green. The narrator tells us that this young boy adored monster movies and wished that they were true. As the saying goes, be careful what you ask for. And the scene immediately shifts to grad student Devon, running fearlessly into peril. Our hero is already facing demons on page two as Mark and Draco doesn't waste any time putting him in danger. We see a terrifying yet stunning sequence of Devon fighting with the Creeper. He manages to impale the Creeper, but obviously, being an immortal entity, the injury doesn't face him much, and the Creeper pushes him. Having been pushed by the Creeper, Devon stumbles and tumbles down a former mineshaft, and things go horribly wrong from there. In an effort to navigate his way back to the surface, he turns on the flashlight on his phone, and we go all the way back to 1962 once more. There are several miners moving together down the same shaft. In spite of the reservations of at least one follower, their leader, a miner named George, continues to lead them through a hole in the wall in the hope of discovering riches, but instead discovers a horrifying spectacle that none of them were prepared for. They come face to face with a gigantic cave filled head to toe with dead bodies. Faced with the horrifying sight, the miners begin running away, although it is pretty much a given that they will not make it out of the mine caves alive. The creeper starts killing them off, one by one, beheading them, but suddenly the mine shaft blows up in a major explosion, leading to a series of explosions all throughout the mining town. Any guesses for the name of the mining town? Yeah, you guessed it, Centralia. The scenes keep shifting from the mining town accident and Devon running from the creeper in modern-day Roanoke. Devon finally manages to make his way out of the mine shaft and gets into his car, but the creeper descends on his car, smashes through the windshield, and takes Devon away, flying off with him, gripped in his talons into the night sky. Devon, our contemporary target, is really just a classic horror victim under Andreko's pen, someone with some knowledge but not enough to significantly improve his circumstances or fend off the creeper. He appears to be relatively capable, but a standard liberal art student can only accomplish so much against a monster like the one pursuing him across Central. Panels do a good job of explaining why people should be so terrified of the titular creature. 
and Draco is able to maintain the idea of an inhuman intelligence that surpasses the intelligence of a common animal as well as a level of barbarity that keeps to a feral nature by refraining from using dialogue for the creature, unlike previous issues of the series and acting more like the source material. Cuba Ball's engaging illustrations assist in enhancing the narrative to some extent. In most circumstances, a truly terrifying horror comic requires a specific kind of use of perspective, and Jeepers Creepers is no exception. Ball amplifies the horror he incites by using camera angles that frequently keep the creeper out of sight until the moment of action. Baal also helps the plot work best in the present. Baal uses plenty of darkness, whether it's from tunnels, a flare's shadow, or other sources, to create a sense of dread, even though the creeper may be too overtly present to be truly menacing in the same manner as in the flashback. Devin confronts the creeper in his cave in this issue. We are shown a previously unseen pre-feeding ritual when Devin awakens and confronts the unconquerable creature hanging upside down. It turns out that he was captured by the demon and suspended from the ceiling of his lair, bound and stripped of all clothing. The ritual is bizarre and even borderline sexual as the creeper dips his fingers in blood and traces the blood down from his navel to his face, rubbing it all over. As Devon gags from the stench of the blood and pukes while hanging upside down, the creeper moves away from him. Not for long, however, as it comes back and hauls up Devon, bringing him to an upright position and kissing him before chucking him down a cave. Due to Devon being alone with the Creeper, there's hardly any spoken interaction outside of his own thoughts. This issue's main subject is the Creeper and the horrific techniques he employs to dismember his victims. The Creeper continues his bizarre ritual as he hauls Devon up, but we also see Devon trying to break free from his restraints. Before the Creeper can kill him, he manages to break free from the ties and injures the Creeper. In fact, he manages to crush the Creeper's head by bashing it in with a rock, leaving the immortal cannibal monster dying in a pool of blood. However, did he really think that killing a creature that has been alive since the beginning of time was that easy? He wakes up in a hospital bed, but it turns out that it's all a hallucination. He's dead. The Creeper did kill him in the end. Not only did the Creeper kill him, but it also took his eyes. Fans of the movies will know that the Creeper takes up the body parts of people to replace his old ones, so it is safe to assume that Devin's eyes are now the Creeper's. In fact, in the end, it turns out that the Creeper's victims are all tied to him and to one another after they die, which is the finest revelation. It's a spooky and frightening fact, the only one in the entire series that even approaches being frightful. There are numerous ghostly victims pacing the blurry space between life and death, lost because the Creeper killed them and absorbed their body parts. A terrifying ending for an ambitious young grad student, Devon. If you're a fan of the movies, then this comic book series is definitely worth checking out. The art, especially the illustrations of the Creeper, is absolutely outstanding. The story is a slow burn, but it's interspersed with enough creeper content to keep the reader hooked. The final ending is definitely a grim and dark one, but it is up to the mark with all things considered. It simply isn't possible for a geeky grad student to single-handedly kill or destroy the creeper. After all, everything about the creepy monster. The comic series gives us a lot more insight into the history and origins of the creeper, so here is all we know about him. We know that the Creeper can regrow any portion of his body by swallowing the victim's equivalent component like an eye for an eye. He has lasted for decades in this manner, repairing his decrepit body by feasting on humans as replacement parts. The Creeper may discard wounded or mutilated body parts after consuming a replacement version, making it a type of healing factor. In addition to these regeneration abilities, the Creeper is extremely durable. He survived many gunshot wounds to crucial places as well as impacts from approaching automobiles and falls from heights that would kill most people. He gets impaled numerous times in the second movie and has head wounds as well. Despite all that, he is able to move. He only stops moving when he is in hibernation. Anatomically, the creeper is a humanoid-like figure. He possesses razor-sharp claws and fangs, and his skin is dark green and scaly, like a reptile. Hidden behind his black duster coat are two gigantic bat-like wings, which make him really strong and capable of lifting both himself and at least one other adult. Creeper is shown picking up a truck off the ground mid-flight in the second movie. The speed at which he can fly is unknown, however, he is shown to easily equal the speed of a fast vehicle. The Creeper has a third nostril on the bridge of his nose, which allows him to detect specific organs in his victims. This second olfactory sense can only identify important components when the victim is in a fearful state. This may be addressed by suppressing one's fear, rendering them useless to the Creeper. The Creeper can be said to be similar to a Chimera. The humanoid body components are supported by a second, nearly indestructible species that doesn't appear to be the result of any earthly evolutionary line. 
This second creature creates the creeper's wings and clawed hood structures that are seen behind the humanoid skull. The creeper further possesses incredible power and speed. He has the strength to flip cars, break apart their frames, and rip human body parts with his bare hands. He also has the ability to climb vertical objects like a spider and is skilled in physical warfare, including the use of melee and throwing weapons. While the Creeper doesn't speak in the films, he does speak in this comic. His speech is mostly animalistic growls and roars most of the time, and he's able to scream loud enough to break glass and kill multiple birds and ravens at once. However, in the comics, he occasionally does have coherent speech, enough to tell Devon to come and find him. He's also noted for whistling the Jeepers Creepers theme tune, <laughs> something that we miss in the comics. Taking the new lore that the comic book adds to the Jeepers Creepers mythos, we have to take into account the creature's existence across cultures and over time. The Creeper is most definitely an ancient creature of darkness, immortal, unnerving, and just plain evil. In the end, this comic book does a deep dive into the history and lore of the Creeper, which really adds to the franchise. The art is amazing, and the build-up makes it extremely exciting as we watch how the Creeper has terrorized people through the ages. The solution is simple. Sacrifice one person to him every time he gets hungry. It seems to be the only way to prevent a massacre each time he comes out of his slumber. Have you read the comic book series? Tell us what you think about it in the comments section below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.